Father, Lord, thank you so much for this wonderful day today. Father, uh, we thank you for uh, everything that you do for us, Lord, for giving us breath to be here today. Lord, thank you for uh, springtime. We thank you for the flowers budding and uh, the, the sign of, uh, of new life, Lord, uh, just uh, starting again, Father. And, and thank you that you allow us a new chance to serve you every day. Father, we thank you for the moms here today, especially the, the Christian ladies, Father, that, uh, that we've been blessed with. Lord, just uh, continue to strengthen them, Lord, help them to look to you. And Father, uh, lift up the prayer requests we've already brought before you, Lord, but please help us to, to keep our focus on you. And Lord, pray for our nation right now. Father, uh, pray for, for people who, who don't see the sin. Father, that they don't recognize it. And, and Father, I just pray, Father, that people's hearts would turn towards you. And Lord, that they get saved. Father, you must be born again. And Lord, uh, that's what this country needs more than anything. And Father, just uh, ask you to bless this time we have together now. And, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 It's amazing how God works. I know this morning, Brother David used some verses, talked about Abraham. We're going to be talking about a story in the Old Testament. Uh, if you'll turn to Genesis chapter 21, please. And here, uh, there's a, a background for this. We're going to be in Genesis chapter one, 21, but I'll give you some of the, some of the background of this. This is a story about Hagar. And you'll hear Hagar was a handmaid, right, of an uh, Egyptian handmaid of Sarah. And Abraham and Sarah uh, were barren. Well, Sarah was barren, wasn't able to have any children. And so we're starting off in Genesis chapter 16. Sarah said unto Abram, Behold now, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go in unto my maid. It may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abram hearkened to the voice of Sarai. After Hagar conceived, her mistress was despised in her eyes. So Abram... Then, you know, being the wisdom, <laughs> the wise man that he was, he told her, you go deal with Hagar, Sarah. <laughs> he sort of washed his hands with it, right? <laughs> and Hagar fled from Sarah's face. The angel of the Lord actually meets with Hagar and tells her to go back. God's going to make Ishmael a great nation. He even said, name him Ishmael. And, you know, there's so many stories here that, that we could think about and so many points about God's wisdom and his grace uh, but, but it's amazing, right, how we can only mess things up. Um, you know, Abram was 90 when God made the covenant with him. So at the time, he was 86 years old when, when Hagar got pregnant and delivered uh, Ishmael. And we're going to go to those verses in a second. But between chapter 16 and the text of the story, a lot happens. Sodom and Gomorrah happens. And then Abraham and Sarah in chapter 20 are actually in front of King Abimelech. And if you remember the story, he was sporting with Sarah. And so King Abimelech didn't, you know, he assumed that there was something more than Sarah just being her, the sister of Abram, right? And, and Abram lied to the king, basically. And then finally he, confronted, he told him that. And Abimelech said, you know how badly I could have sinned if I had taken your wife, Sarah? So all this stuff, I'm just trying to give you the background. All this stuff happened, right? And here we're going to think about it, right? God chose Abraham to be a mighty man to lead people. Father Abraham, right, <laughs> is revered around the world. And yet look at the things that Abraham did that, that were wrong. The first thing was, you know, should he have ever listened to Sarah? Because we know God intended in the beginning one man and one woman. He, didn't, he never said or sanctioned multiple marriages. That's something that man did on his own. And every time there's been multiple marriages, there's been problems. <laughs> there's been problems, right? There's jealousy, especially, you know, multiple wives. And we see this here. Here's Sarah, who is so, so bent on having a child... Told, told him, take Hagar. And then as soon as Hagar conceived, right, she was upset. And, and so just that's sort of the, just the background for the story. So, uh, you know, Abram having a second wife did nothing but cause trouble for him. It's interesting that we all in this world still pay the price for Abram not listening to God, you know, and not doing things God's way. And we see now, right, and, and we, we talk about it, the Muslim religion versus Christianity. I mean, Ishmael, 
came. God said he would make him a mighty nation. And he's turned out to be a mighty nation, right? They're a very strong influence in the world today. But they, Ishmael, was not the child of promise. Isaac, or, you know, Jake is going to be the child of the promise. So, and then we're going to go through a lot of great, lot of great things that happen here. So, so our text, go to Genesis chapter 21, verse 9. This is, we'll go through the story real quick and go back and hit the points. And Sarah saw the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, which she had born in Abraham, mocking. So now, here's the other thing. Hagar wasn't guiltless here. She was mocking the fact that, hey, now I'm pregnant, right? And Sarah, you're not. Wherefore, she said unto Abraham, cast out this bondwoman and her son, for the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. And the thing was very grievous in Abraham's sight because of his son. And God said unto Abram, Let it not be grievous in thy sight because of the lad and because of thy bondwoman. In all that Sarah has said unto thee, hearken unto her voice. For in Isaac shall thy seed be called. And also the son of the bondwoman will I make a nation because he is thy seed. And Abram rose up early in the morning and took bread and a bottle of water and gave it unto Hagar, putting it on her shoulder and the child, and sent her away. And she departed and wandered in the wilderness of Beersheba. Now, we'll get into that. Just, just that alone. Isn't it amazing what God says and what he doesn't say? So think about it. Abraham was, was rich. Now he'd made the covenant. God had made the covenant. So his name was changed from Abraham to Abraham. Uh, and, and he sends her off with water and bread. That's it. Hey, get out of here now. You've been in my household all this time. I've been taking care of you. The harder part with this was at this time, right, Ishmael was like 17 years old. And Isaac is young in the story. He's like three years old. So it's like a 14-year difference. So Abram had raised his son, Ishmael, right? And I'm sure he loved him. He was his son, and he was part of his family. And now Isaac, the child of promise, comes along, right? We know how the Bible tells us. I, I've told you in my own life, you know, you looked at the story of Joseph and his brothers and, and how God tells us not to have favorites. You can't have favorites. Regardless of how big your family is and stuff. And yet, you know, so, so you just think about all the, all the dynamics that went on in this relationship with that. Now Hagar, you know, gets sent out in this wilderness. And, and I'm sure she's like beside herself. I can't even imagine what she must have been going through. I'm sure, you know, this is really a Mother's Day. It's really not a Mother's Day message, but it's talking about a mother here. Can you imagine? Brother David was talking about how a mother will do anything to defend her children She's now sent out with her son. Now, her son wasn't a baby. He was 17 years old, but they're still sent out basically with nothing at all. Go out into the wilderness. So Ishmael, how was he feeling at this, right? Maybe he realized, you know, that, hey, I'm not the son with promise now. I'm not the favored son. And here I am. I'm the older son. And we all know how traditions of men and things were, right? The oldest son is usually the one to get the blessing. Unless... God intervenes. <laughs> it wasn't the oldest son that was going to get the blessing, right? It was going to be Isaac. So, you know, he realized now Isaac is the son that has promise. And now he's only three years old. So this is a teenager looking at his little brother, knowing that he's the one, he's the one that God likes you better. <laughs> God likes you better. That's a, probably even a harder thing, right? He realized that he'll never be anything more than he is right now. And so he's jealous. And he acts out a little bit at the feast. Sarah loses control, and she demands, Hagar, hey, Get him out of here. I, I want him out. I don't want to look at him anymore. I want him out of my face. So Abraham was reluctant in verse 11 of our text. He was reluctant to do what Sarah was demanding. You know, after all, he was a dad, right? I'm sure he, he had a parental responsibilities. He didn't want to send his son out into the wilderness. Which one of us would want to do that? And if you've had to deal with hard things with your kids, you know, how would you really feel about sending them out completely, almost disowning them and sending them out? on their own. You know, the shame is we hear today the, where that's happening is people in foreign countries that are not Christians, that their kids turn to faith in Christ and they're, they're disowned by their family. Read the story. I was just thinking about Brother Victor because, you know, Brother Victor in India and he sends us his prayer letters. It's amazing what they go through in India right now. It's amazing how, how against Christianity the government is. 
And, and you know, you read the stories back there about, about Indian people, and, and we can't appreciate it, but what Brother, what Brother Paul faces every day, what they're trying to do to reach people and win them to the Lord, right? They face great, great persecution and suffering from those things. So in the next chapter of Genesis, and when we get to Genesis chapter 22, God is going to command Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac. I mean, this is something we couldn't make up, right? We couldn't make these stories. But think about it now. He basically tells them, get rid of, get rid of Ishmael, right? Sends him off. What would have happened if, if he didn't do that? If, if he'd have kept him in the household, right? Would he have ever gone and obeyed God in chapter 22 and sacrificed Isaac? Have you ever thought about that? And he's more for the fathers, but the mothers too. That what a, what a great commandment that was and a test for Abraham to take Isaac after waiting all this time for Isaac, right? He was a, Abraham was old when Isaac was born and Sarah to then say, go and sacrifice your son to me. I mean, you know, we can talk about this, oh, how easy that must have been and everything, but this is, it's, it's like, when we really think about these things, these are situations that are almost unbearable to even think, how would we handle that? Yeah, how would I, I, I think about those things? I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't handle that well. <laughs> I wouldn't have handled it well. We all know life is, is going to be like this at times. You know, things can be going well one moment in our lives, and then the next we're on our backs looking up, wondering how we got there. I think about Brother Wayne. Brother Wayne was going in for hernia surgery, right? Healthy. Brother Wayne was healthy, exercised, still in great shape, ate right, going in for a simple hernia surgery. Doctor says, no problem, everything's going to go great. Boom. Next week, he's gone. Uh, you know, none of us know, folks. I mean, when God's going to take us. <laughs> we, we have no idea what's going to happen later on today. Um, so verse 13, right? that's the reality of our lives. Why did you just send him away with a bottle and, and a little bread? And, and you know, God gives us plenty of examples in the Bible for the burdens that we're going to face, and they're never going to exceed God's ability to bear them. Now, that's why we can't face any of this stuff, God. God is the only one that can handle this life. None of us are equipped to handle the things that are going to come our way, the, the things that are outside of our control. And that's not the thing that, they, that makes us most, this, this, this hard situation we're facing now. Hey, for as much as we disagree with the Catholics and what they do, one thing they're very, the, the official thing they do is pro-life. <laughs> yeah. There are Catholics that still go to Planned Parenthood, and although they're praying the rosary and stuff, they're outside praying, right, trying to stop, trying to stop that from happening. 60 million deaths in our country. So, so all, although, you know, and more, more than 60 million, uh, the, the reality is the official position of the church is they're against it. And yet, Brother David mentioned we have a president who says he's a Catholic and who's, who's flopped completely, and now it's, it's, it's so ridiculous. And the, you look at the protesters, that's why we need to pray for these people. The hatred that's in these people that, that want to kill babies and, and how it's a woman's right. And, and the other thing that's really interesting, folks, is... You know, it's my body, my choice. How about all this mass mandates? Where's all the, you know, how, how did all this, all this diatribe against all this stuff, my body, my choice, right? Shouldn't we all been saying that for the last two years? Hey, get, get away with these masks. But, you know, I digress. That has nothing to do with this thing. So it, it all just comes down to us. Are we trusting God or not? Are we trusting God or not? You know, in, in, uh, in verse 16, you know, Hagar's heart was broken. She is sure that Ishmael is going to die. She leaves him under a bush, and she goes away because she doesn't want to witness the death of her son. Now, and again, he was 17 years old, so, uh, but, but she sends him away. A bow shot was like about 1,000 feet. <laughs> so she leaves Ishmael there, and she goes off away because she doesn't want to watch him die. And she, she had no way to escape. Now, I'm trying to picture what the land is because I like to do that for me, a, a desert. Barren land, nothing there, dry, unbelievably hot in the daytime. I mean, you know, it, it was a, a situation she had no, no way to figure out how to escape from. Have you ever been there? 
Yeah, is there a situation that you got into, you dug yourself so deep that you really have no, no idea how you're going to get out of it? David found himself in a hopeless place like that, you know, in Psalm 55. Uh, and most of us like to be in control of things, right? I, I'm that way, and I'm sure a lot of you folks are. I don't like to see something broken, I want to fix it. If something's broken, it drives me crazy until you fix it, and until we try. But the reality is, what happens when we try to fix things ourselves usually? <laughs> We make them. We make them worse. <laughs> so you know, God had told Hagar that He was going to make Ishmael the father of a great nation in Genesis chapter 16. He told her that. So, just like He promised Abraham about Isaac, right, and that, and that His seed was going to be more multitudinous than all the stars. I mean, how did how did she lose believing in God, and yet? God put her in this situation. And we think about it. So we have all these promises from God, and yet, don't we doubt the same way? Shouldn't we be trusting in God for the things that he's going to do for us? The fact is, you know, this life hurts, and, and sometimes it hurts bad. What we fail to see is that God has got a path for us, and, you know, he's going to give the promises that, that he's made to each one of us. And, you know, we may not understand at all. And I think the reality is God's ways are higher than our ways, and we can't understand. I'll tell you, you know, my own heart, lately there's been a lot of, you know, we've talked about this, there's a lot of startup churches, there's a lot of people that claim to be Christians. Brother David mentioned this morning pastors going and praying over abortion clinics and things, right? So-called pastors, I'm going to call them that. And this is where the rub is, folks. Christianity is not a Burger King religion. You know, we've had that preached to us over the years. God's word is true. And you know what? So anytime we deviate and we want to say we go away from this book, right, to justify what we're doing, it, it doesn't make it right. And yet we're going to be viewed as being unbelievably separatist and staunch. Do you know how many churches stand on the King James Bible? A handful, if that many now, that actually say they believe the word of God. And, and thank God for our church, right? And we're not doing it to brag, but unapologetically. I came out of a church where I was taught the one true Catholic, holy and apostolic church. And everybody else was false. And folks, I got lied to. And you know what? This book is the truth. Every word, okay? And the original Hebrew and Greek was inspired, but we have the word of God translated correctly in English for us. It's the only honest translation, right? And yet, that's not an issue. In Christianity, Christians don't want to talk about this. Well, you guys are crazy. And, and a lot of the new, younger people that are coming out are not taking a stand on this. Because it's all, they're all going to say, well, it's all the translation. It's just like the casualness of stuff. You go through the Old Testament and talk about worship for God. Worship has never been something that's been a, hey, let's do it my way kind of thing. Yeah? I was reading about the temple. I thought about you, John, you know, the, the, the brother of the temple, the, the, the temple that Brother Bib had made for us and stuff. That, that, and, and looking at the dimensions, the, the walls, it was 45 feet high. You know, I was thinking about our church and, you know, look at how high our roof is here. Why? Why was it ever made that? It was referenced from the Old Testament, right? That God, it's, it's, it's God's house. It's not our house. You wouldn't make your house with ceilings that high, right? And we know it's not the building, it's the people. But all these things today, um, I, I just, the, the, old, the old bulwarks, the old landmarks. And you can get discouraged. I'm, I'm sure you guys get discouraged. I get discouraged. I'm sure our pastor can be discouraged at times. Yeah. Um, we just need to stick to the stuff. We need to trust the Lord and stay faithful to him and his word. You know, God had a plan for all this. Pain and suffering are both part of God's plan. And, you know, and we look at it. Elijah, the story of Elijah and the widow of Zarephath. The three Hebrews, Daniel, the disciples on the boat when the water got rough, right? The 5,000 people that were hungry and Jesus did the miracle and, and healed on them. How, you know, God gave us instances to show us that as impossible as we think that things are in this life, that he's got a plan for all those things. So thank God that he's the one that's in control and pulling the strings for us on all these things. So, you know, God's presence is here. He was, his presence was there in verse 17 of our text. God was there the whole time. 
Let's go to verse 17. We hadn't read that. God heard the voice of the lad, and the angel of God called to Hagar out of heaven and said unto her, What aileth thee, Hagar? Fear not, for God hath heard the voice of the lad where he is. So interestingly enough, is regardless of what, what she prayed, he heard the voice of Ishmael. Ishmael cried out to him too. God had called this woman by name. He made a promise. He had told her, Ishmael's going to be a great nation, and he's going to take care of you. And then God opened her eyes in verse 19, and he, she saw a well of water. A well of water. Isn't it amazing how God works? How did the well get there? Did God just create it? Was it already there? And she just was so blinded by her situation right now, she didn't see it? Had it been dug by, by travelers that had gone through? Was it a natural well? Or is it something that somebody had actually dug and was there prepared for this time? And, you know, we need to trust the fact that God is in our today. He's also in our tomorrow. You know, it's just, are we going to trust in him? Or are we going to turn away from one of these things? And that's just what we do. You know, there's salvation for the lost. God wants people to be saved. So, you know, as, as upset as we are today about all the things going on in politics, we need to focus on the fact that people need to be born again. And we need to speak the truth in love. And, you know, the hard part is this. There's no way to speak the truth in love to people, like, you know, getting the shouting matches with people that they want to kill babies and stuff. There's no way to say that other than God. This is a, a, a newborn life, the moment of conception. The moment of conception, God knew you. <laughs> God planned for you. Over 60 million souls that God had intended to be born aren't here. And do we really expect God to bless us? Yeah. How can he bless us? We're no better than any of these kingdoms that were in the past to sacrifice their children to the fire. There's hope for the hopeless. And that's, that's the great news. There's hope for the hopeless. Look at all these people. Millions of people are leaving Ukraine right now. This world is in a mess. Millions of immigrants are coming in on our southern border. I mean, we, there's trouble all around us, folks. There is no safe place in the world. There are shootings. Look at the shootings. Somebody was killed in Highgate yesterday. There are shootings everywhere. There's no more safe thing. Uh, a woman was walking in our development the other night and, and, uh, and said she was walking her dog and was trying to go out when there wasn't people and stuff like that. And some man approached her or something. So it's like there's no place that's, that's safe in this world anymore. Aside from God. That's why we need to keep our eyes on him. There's joy for the brokenhearted. 1 Peter 4.13, but rejoice in so as much as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding joy. So God's got answers for us for all these things. You know, he gives us provisions. You know, God says he'll supply all our need according to his riches. It's amazing what Brother Dave just talked about today, this Ukrainian family that's coming. So think about it. A guy, a doctor, a nurse, probably lived in a nice home, and now they're going to come to a shack. They'll come to a shack. But it's a new start. You know what? I bet they won't care. <laughs> I bet they'll be excited to come to a place. But as sure, is it going to be an eye-opener? It's going to be a wonderful eye-opener, right? What do we see today? Hey, folks, how about right here in Vermont? Young people that are getting married right now, your daughter was just able to get a place, right? But you know how expensive it is for young people to start off? This is a time is, is being viewed as a bad thing when a lot of kids are living at home with their parents. You know, they joke about living in the basement of your parents' home. But there's a, in some cases now, it's getting to be financially where it's almost impossible for, for people to get a start of things. But, you know, things... This is the time God has got us in now. But the, there's, no, there's nothing new under the sun, folks. You know, our problem is we've been spoiled in the United States. We've been spoiled for so long. The rest of the, this stuff has been going on, and we never realized it. And guess what? It's coming, it's coming to hit home now <laughs> for us all. God knows what we need. You know, he tells us in Matthew chapter 6, you know, he knows, take no thought for your life. What ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on, is not the life more than the meat and the body than raiment. God tells us he takes care of the fowls of the air. He takes care of the lilies. He dresses the lilies in the field. And we look at it now. Creation is coming alive, right? It's that picture of God again. Every year he gives us a new picture. He brings it back to life. 
<laughs> yeah. So Dave had the turtle <laughs> being the symbol of Mother Earth. God is, there is no Mother Earth. God is the creator of everything. God is the sustainer of everything. <laughs> we are not going to destroy this planet, folks. <laughs> Boy, there's so many things. That's what you say. This message, there are so many things that God has in his word for us, right? So many promises. And we can get so, we can get so sidetracked on things. So, you know, God has a plan to help us all. God's got a plan. God had a plan for this, for this lady. Right. Go back up to finish the text here. Uh, in God, let's start off in verse 18. Arise, lift up the lad and hold him in thine hand, for I will make him a great nation. And God opened her eyes and saw a well of water, and she went and filled the bottle with water and gave the lad drink. And God was with the lad, and he grew and dwelt in the wilderness and became an archer. And he dwelt in the wilderness of Paran, and his mother took him a wife out of the land of Egypt. Now God now condenses all his life, leaves out all these details about living day to day, finding food, shelter, all those things. And we know right, that he just leaves it off there. And God does that in many cases. He gives us the thing that he wants us to have. <laughs> and, then, and then he just says, okay. Uh, so... Not much of a, a specific Mother's Day message today other than this, this mom, Hagar, she cared about her child. Obviously, Sarah cared, cared about her, her son, Isaac. Right? They were both trying to do the best thing they could for their kids. But and most importantly, right, the only right thing we can do is when we look to God and, and trust him and his wisdom for answers and, and not get upset. Right? That's why... As much as we are unhappy when things happen around us, we just need to keep trusting in God. We need to keep staying close to his word. He's the only hope that we have. He's the only answer that we have. So happy Mother's Day, ladies. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully you won't have to go through. Hopefully you won't have to go through what, what that lady Hagar went through. <laughs> but we all have things. We know we all have things that we'll be going through. So let's pray, please. Father, just uh, thank you for your grace. Lord, uh, pray for this time that we have just to, to think about you before we go. Pray for, uh, for mothers today that you'd honor them. Lord, that you'd give great times of celebration with families. And Lord, uh, please help us to, to realize, Lord, that, that you are still on the throne and, and you are in the business of saving people and you want no one to perish. Father, uh, you want to save souls. You want to change lives. So please, Father, help us to trust in you. Help us to whatever issues that we're dealing with, whatever situations, to, to put our faith in you, Lord. And know that someday, Lord, all this will be at an end. All the trials and tribulations will be over, Lord. Father, I, I just pray that uh, you'd give us a, a wonderful day now. Thank you for the sunshine. Lord, I'll bring us back together safely at the next appointed time. And, and we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.